Today we are going to talk about chapter four, which is called chemical reactions. A physical property is any characteristic of a material that you can observe without changing the identity of the substance. For example, size, shape, state of matter, volume, and volume are examples of physical properties. These are things that are characteristic of a material, but changing them doesn't change the identity of the substance. You can have different size apples, you have different shape apples, you can have different volumes of apple juice, you can have liquid water, gaseous water. The identity of the substance stays the same. For a chemical property, a chemical property is any characteristic of a material that indicates whether it can undergo a certain chemical change. So it changes the substance. So burning is an example of a chemical property. Explosions are examples of chemical properties. Rotting, rusting, and bubbling are all properties that indicate a chemical change has occurred. You are creating a new substance when all of those things have happened. A physical change is a change in the size, shape, or state of matter. A new substance is not formed. The change can be reversed. So for example, if you cut a piece of bread, this bread is the same as this bread, the composition of that bread is the same. If you take a Coke pan and pour it into a Coke bottle, the Coke composition is still the same. You have just changed the shape of the container. If you freeze water, the composition of the water is the same as the composition of the ice. A new substance is not formed, the change can be reversed. A chemical change is a change from one substance to another. A new substance forms and the change cannot be reversed. Burning a log, for example, turns the log into a new substance, ash. You cannot turn that ash back into the intact wood. Rusting, rusting of metal. Once the metal rusts and turns into iron oxide, you cannot reverse that orange rust back into the shiny metal. You can scrape it away and reveal a new layer of, of metal, but you can't turn that rust back into the original metal. Bubbling or effervescing is an example of a chemical change. It's the release of a gas in a reaction. You are creating a new substance. You are creating a gas, and that change cannot be reversed. You can't take those gas particles and push them back into that solid state and have the same thing. So take a look at these examples and tell me whether, or identify by yourself, whether they are examples of physical or chemical changes. Cutting a sandwich, physical change. The substance has not changed its identity. Burning a match, chemical. Spoiling milk, chemical. Making popsicles, physical. Rusting hammer, chemical. Emptying a gallon of milk, physical. Mixing two clear liquids and getting a yellow substance, chemical. Making jello, physical. There are also two different types of reactions. We can classify reactions as based on their ability to absorb or release energy. Okay, so if we have this little graph here and we have energy on the y-axis and let's say in order for a reaction to occur it requires 10,000 joules of energy which is represented by this red line here okay this is what we're going to call the activation energy the activation energy is the energy needed to start a reaction in order for the bonds to break so there are certain reactions that need an input of energy. You have to put 10,000 joules or so many joules to get to that 10,000 mark. Okay? There are some reactions that once they get started, they have an excess of energy and they actually release more energy than you put into them. Okay? So for the reactions that are below this line, the ones that need energy, um, and energy can be in the form of light, heat, or electricity uh, that you take from your surroundings. Those are called endergonic reactions. They take energy from the surroundings in order to reach that activation energy. Um, if that energy is specifically in the form of heat, it gets labeled endothermic, where thermic means heat, uh, from the surroundings. 
So endergonic is a general term for any type of energy from the surroundings. If that energy is specifically heat, it is called an endothermic reaction. Um, one way to remember that endothermic means that heat is taken from the surroundings is that the first two letters of endothermic are the first two letters of the word enter. So for an endothermic reaction, heat has to enter from the surroundings. It has to be taken in from the surroundings in order to reach that activation energy. It is a need of heat or energy for it to occur. The reactions that have the 10,000 joules and excess, so they have an excess of the activation energy, um, they release energy in the form of light, heat, or electricity to the surroundings. We call those exergonic reactions. So they release energy to the surroundings. Exer is different than endo that we saw in the previous slide. Gonic means general term for any type of energy. If that energy is specifically heat, we call it exothermic, referring to heat. And one way to remember that exo exergonic or exothermic means releasing heat is that the first two letters of exo are the first two letters of the word exit. So heat exits the reaction into the surroundings. Okay, examples of exothermic reactions or rather what an exothermic reaction is, it releases energy to the surroundings. The temperature of the surroundings is going to get hotter. Okay, the, the surroundings will get an increase in, in temperature. Examples are combustion, which is anytime you um, heat something up and it reacts with oxygen in an explosion, the oxidation of carbohydrates in plants and animals, and when you mix water and calcium hydroxide, the reaction gets formed. Endothermic reactions um, absorb energy. Whoops, these are pictures of exothermic reactions. Endothermic reactions um, absorb energy. The temperature of the surroundings gets colder you'll see a decrease in temperature. Examples of endothermic reactions are the thermal decomposition of limestone by heating. So anytime you have to heat something up, that's endothermic. Photosynthesis requires the input of sunlight and ammonium chloride plus water. If you did that experiment, you would feel that the surroundings um, had a decrease in temperature. All right, this next activity is get you familiar with the parts of a chemical reaction. In your notes, there should be a blank equation that looks like this, and there is a word bank above. Go ahead and press pause on this video and see if you can correctly identify the parts to that equation with the correct word that it corresponds to. So A is referring to all of these. Those are the reactants. B is referring to all of these on the right-hand side of this arrow. Those are called products. C is referring, uh, so this PowerPoint is formatted a little funky. This arrow should actually be pointing to this AQ, which stands for aqueous. We will learn later that aqueous means dissolved in water. Um, so in a chemical equation, you have your reactants on one side, an arrow and your products on the right hand side of the arrow. You have chemical formulas and you have subscripts. You have um, you also have subscripts that tell you the state of matter of each of those compounds and so they can either be solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous and so C is representing aqueous. D is pointing to this L right here so that L represents liquid. E Again, this is formatted weird. E is pointing to this two right here, which we learned is called a subscript. It's a number written to the bottom of a formula. S is referring to the S state of matter, which is a solid. G is referring to this whole number, red whole number out there, which is called a coefficient. We'll talk about how that is used to balance equations later. And then this arrow is called a yields or produces sign. So this just goes through, if you have L, A, Q, S, or G as your subscripts, they refer to the state of matter. L stands for liquid, A, Q stands for aqueous, S stands for solid, and G stands for gas. If you have a word that is written above an arrow, you might see the word heat, light, or E-L-E-C. 
Um, heat means that the reactants are heated in that reaction. Light means the reactants are exposed to light. And ELEC means an electric current is applied to the reactant. In, acti in activity two, we're just going to identify the reactants and products in the following examples. Um, you have these in your notes. Go ahead and press pause in your notes uh, or pause in this video and take a couple minutes to see if you can do this on your own. And then when you are done, press play and see if you are right. So the reactants here are N2 and H2. Anything on the left side of the arrow is a reactant. And the products would be whatever is on the right-hand side of the arrow, which is NH3. Reactants here, H2O, products H2 and O2. So again, the arrow separates the reactant side from the product side. Reactants here, Na, HCl, the products NaCl, H2. The reactants, C10H8. And O2, the products CO2 and H2O. You don't need to put the coefficients. You don't have to put that large whole number 12 or that 10 or that 4. That's not what this activity is, is asking you to do. If you have it, it's not a problem, but just know that you don't have to have those numbers and, or know what they mean right now. Reactants here, CH2S and F2, products CF4, HF, and SF6. Reactants, H2 and O2, products, H2O. Counting atoms. So atoms, we need to know where the reactants and products are because what we're going to see in a second is that equations have to be balanced according to the conservation of mass. You can't just like create mass or matter and you can't just destroy it. So in order to figure out whether mass and matter has been conserved, we have to know how to count the atoms on each side of an equation. So we're going to count the atoms on the product side. Um, the subscript, we're just going to talk about subscripts right now, and then we'll add coefficients. The subscript tells you that for the reactant side, there are going to be, um, the subscript indicates the number of atoms of that element. So for nitrogen, there are two nitrogen atoms on the reactant side, and there are two hydrogen atoms. For the product side, we have NH3. If there is no number written next to the N, it means, shoot, you press one wrong button, it takes you all the way to the end of the slides. So, uh, so if there is no subscript written next to the N, then that subscript is one. This three only refers to the hydrogen. It does not refer to the N. So there is one N and there are three H's. Now, if you notice right now, these are not balanced. We have two nitrogens, one nitrogen here, and we have two hydrogens and three hydrogens. Right now, they're not balanced. We'll talk about in a couple minutes how to balance them, but right now, they're most likely not going to match up, but just know that in the future, they should. So this is just a beginner counting Adams example. All right, here we have H2O. We're going to count the reactants H's. There's two hydrogens. There's one oxygen. On the product side, we have two hydrogens and we have two oxygens. Okay, so this is activity three. Go ahead and press pause on this video and complete activity three and then come back to check your answers. So here, sodium, we have one. H, we have one. Cl, we have one on the reactant side. On the product side, we have one, one, I'm sorry, one, two hydrogens, and one chlorine. Here, for number two, we have 10 Cs, eight Hs, two Os. For the carbons, we have one. For the Hs, we have two. Now, for the oxygens, you may have figured this out, but there are two oxygens from CO2, and there is one oxygen from H2O, so you add those together for a total of three. You don't multiply them together, you add them if they appear in more than one compound. For number three, we have one C, two H's, one S, two F's. For the product side, we have one C, one H, one S, and F's, we have four, 
plus 1 plus 6. That gives me 11. For number 4, we have two H's, two O's. We have two H's on the product, one on the one oxygen on the product. For number 5, we have three NA's, one P, five O's, four from here, plus one from here, one K, and one hydrogen. For the product side, we have one NA, one P, five O's, three K's, and one hydrogen. For number six, three C's, six H's, three O's, and on the product side, one C, two H's, three O's. So now we're going to count the atoms, but we're going to add these coefficients. So according to the conservation of mass, you can't, back here, you can't have six hydrogens and then end up with two hydrogens on the product side. It's impossible to make four hydrogen atoms disappear. So how do we account for that? Nature has a way of balancing equations. So what nature does is it tells you how many hydrogens you need to react with nitrogen in order for the conservation of mass to be met. Nature does this on its own. You just have to figure out what those numbers are. Okay. So what a, subs what a coefficient does is it's a number placed in front of a molecule to balance an equation. The coefficient times the subscript tells you the number of atoms of that element. If there is more than one element, the coefficient distributes into each of those elements. So for example, um, we have, if there's no coefficient, it's understood to be one. So we have two nitrogen atoms. For hydrogen, we have six hydrogen, six hydrogens. Basically what H2 is, H2 are two hydrogen atoms bonded together, but the three tells you there are three molecules. So that's where the one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogen atoms comes from. So there are six hydrogen atoms there. For the product side, we have NH3. So basically we have N with three H's. The two tells me I have two of those molecules. So I actually have two of them like this. So what that means is I have two N's and one, two, three, four, five, six H's. So this, you can either draw it out each time, or if you don't have time to do that, the two basically distributes into that N, so that would be two, and then it distributes to the H times three to give you six. So here we have four hydrogens, we have two oxygens. The two distributes to the two from the hydrogen, and it distributes to the one from the oxygen. For the hydrogens, we have four hydrogens, we have two oxygens. Here we have 10 carbons, eight hydrogens, 24 oxygens. Here we have 10 carbons. Now the oxygens, we have 20 from here, but to give you a total oxygen, you also have to get the, f shoot. Sorry about that. find it. Sometimes I just accidentally hit a button and then it brings me all the way back down. <coughs> so you have 20 oxygens from this one, plus you have four oxygens from here. So there is a total of 24 oxygens on the product side. And then you have eight hydrogens. Notice now, if we compare, the carbons are the same on each side, the hydrogens are the same on each side, and the oxygens are the same on each side. All right, press pause and try to fill this activity in on your own, and then we'll go over the answers. Okay, the reactants. Two sodiums, two hydrogens, two chlorines. The product side should also be the same. If you balance it correctly, these numbers should match. For the reactants on number two, we have 10 Cs, eight 
H's, 24 O's, products 10 C's, 8 H's, 24 O's. The 24 comes from 20 from here plus 4 from here. Reactants, 1 carbon, 2 hydrogens, 1 sulfur, 12 fluorines, 1 carbon, 2 hydrogens, 1 sulfur, fluorines, we have 4 plus 2 plus 6 gives me 12. For number four, two or four H's, two O's, four H's, two O's. For number five, the reactants, three NA's, one P, seven O's. We have four O's from here plus three O's from here, three K's, three H's. And on the product side, same thing. For number six, the reactants are three, six, and nine. For the products, three, six, and nine. And that is where we will end for today.